Thank you so much. Um, well, that was inspiring, and this whole conference has been inspiring. I'm delighted that um, Sylvie, and I'm appreciative that, that Sylvie and the Lyft team invited me here today. You know, the one thing I realized about any good conference or any good gathering like this is it's almost like a work of art or a magical scientific breakthrough or a new technology you, you've observed. It, uh, here. let's see, is that better? Higher. Better? Yes. All right. Um, like any technology, magical technology, or um, any amazing piece of art, it changes your perception forever after you experience it. And what I'm going to talk about today um, is a story about changing perceptions, about changing realities. Um, when Sylvie first told me um, that she had been to California and was curious about what she imagined to be a link between uh, the psychedelic counterculture of the 60s and the uh, Silicon Valley computer culture, it really struck a chord with me because it is those two things that brought me to California in 1992, in fact. And I'm going to talk about those because once I was out in California, I really began to understand that it wasn't really just a feeling that I had that these things were interconnected, but that they actually had a deep history together. But the history actually starts, and the story I'm going to tell you starts in Switzerland. This is Albert Hoffman, who in 1938, working at Sandoz as a chemist, stumbled upon a molecule called LSD. And in 1945 or so, he administered LSD to himself after getting a sort of light dose of it, and he went on a magical bike ride. And he experienced hallucinations, changes in perception, a complete shift in his reality on that bike ride. And at that point, the drug was manufactured and released by Sandoz Laboratories. And many people experimented with it. It was released as a psych psychiatric drug. The US military, of course, and the UK military used it and tested it as a possible mind control drug. Psychiatrists around the world were experimenting, it, experimenting with it as a way to potentially treat various psychological diseases. But eventually, it was banned. It was banned in the United States around 1966, but at that point, Pandora's box was already opened. This is Dr. Timothy Leary, who's actually one of the patron saints of Boing Boing. Dr. Leary was a psychologist at Harvard, and he was running experiments with students, willingly, of course, on LSD, and eventually got booted off of campus for those experiments. But he continued the work he became the high priest of acid, going around the country, turning people on, talking about how LSD was an empowerment tool, a technology of change, a technology that enabled people to change their perception of reality, to understand things in new ways, a positive force if used appropriately. And it caught hold. It caught hold in the youth culture and the counterculture that was dealing with Vietnam and other uh, um, sort of trials and experiences of the era. It became a new religion for some people, in fact. LSD was the fuel of the summer of love that began in San Francisco, that began in Golden Gate Park, as Sylvie mentioned, and spread around the world. And LSD was part of that culture, an important part of that culture. And it spread through groups like the Merry Pranksters, Ken Kesey, who many of you know, wrote One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. He had participated in the San Francisco Bay Area in some of the early psychedelic studies, the legal studies of the drug. And once turned on, he gathered friends, and they piled into a psychedelic painted school bus called Further, and they drove across the country turning people on. And in fact, the bus itself was outfitted with some very novel multimedia technology. It had microphones mounted outside that would feed sound into the bus, going through tape loops and various other devices to create and stimulate a psychedelic experience 
whether you were on LSD or not. One of the people on that bus was Stuart Brand. Stuart Brand was an ex-military officer who had spent the 50s traveling around the United States trying to learn from Native American communities. He was sort of a proto-hippie. And he ended up in the Bay Area where he too participated in the acid tests. And so inspired by those, so inspired by the ability of LSD to bombard the senses, to create alternative realities, to shift your perception, that he and the Merry Pranksters launched the acid tests. The first acid tests, which took place in the late 60s in San Francisco, um, were the first place that the Grateful Dead performed. They performed under the name The Warlocks. And these were multimedia concerts, similar to what we might experience today, but at the time were very new, where light, sound, and color mixed with music created a trance-inducing experience, whether you were on LSD or not. It was the birth of light shows, the classic 60s light show. And it helped people to understand that these psychedelic drugs and these psychedelic experiences could be used to program the reality that you wanted to experience. And in many ways, drugs were computers. Of course, they weren't the computers that people were used to in the 40s and 50s. These were what computers looked like in the 40s and 50s. And these are what the people who operated computers looked like in the 40s and 50s. But something changed in the 1960s around computer culture in the Bay Area, steeped in the psychedelic culture, steeped in the uh, uh, months and years before the summer of love. Down at Stanford, this researcher, John McCarthy, was leading a project where he was trying to create a human brain, essentially, in a computer, the first artificial intelligence. He thought he could do it in a decade. The idea being to take computer, humans out of the loop, put computers in the loop. At the same time, across campus, Douglas Engelbart was doing the exact opposite in many ways with computers. What he was trying to do with his augmented intelligence group was to enhance and amplify the human mind using new technology. Now, Engelbart, interestingly, had taken LSD at Stanford during some of the clinical studies there. And the researchers in his laboratory, who were much younger than he was, were very involved in the counterculture happening in the Bay Area at the time. The protest movement, the hippies, the psychedelic scene, the acid tests. And in 1968, Douglas Engelbart and his researchers demonstrated the augmented intelligence technology they had been developing at Stanford in what has become known as the mother of all demos. This is where most of the technologies that we're familiar with today were seen for the very first time. Let's see a clip. Well, you can see the devices that I'm using. I use three, and they're not all standard. We have a pointing device called a mouse, a standard keyboard and a special key set we have here. And we're going to go for a picture down in our laboratory in Menlo Park and pipe it up that'll show you from another point of view more about how that mouse works. Come in, Menlo Park. Okay, there's Don Andrews' hand in Menlo Park. And in a second, we'll see the screen that he's working and the way the tracking spot moves in conjunction with movements of that mouse. I don't know why we call it a mouse. Sometimes I apologize. It started that way, and we never did change it. I encourage all of you to watch the entire demo. It's available on YouTube, and it's really amazing. It's some, the first place that you'll see the technologies that led to word processors, that led to video teleconferencing, the mouse, as you saw. This was a full multimedia, immersive, interactive computing experience. Now, an important note is the person who had been brought in to help coordinate this multimedia demo and to actually stand behind the camera recording that clip that we just saw was our friend Stuart Brand, 
from the acid tests. Now, at the same time, Stuart Brand was looking for a way to spread the message of how technology and how tools of all kinds could be used to empower the individual. Stuart went on to start the Whole Earth Catalog. And these are available online. I recommend you look at them. To me, they're prototypical blogs, and the format of them inside looks very similar to Boing Boing. It would be guides to how to make a, a, one of Buckminster Fuller's geodesic domes, or how to brew beer, or how to uh, uh, you know, fix a radio. All of this all in one place in a catalog. And it was all about access to tools. And it influenced a number of people in Silicon Valley and the world. In fact, I'm going to read a quote from someone who it influenced. When I was young, there was an amazing publication called the Whole Earth Catalog which was one of the Bibles of my generation. It was sort of like Google in paperback form, 35 years before Google came along. It was idealistic and overflowing with neat tools and great notions. The person who said that founded a computer company in 1977, and that was Steve Jobs. Now, something else besides the Whole Earth Catalog had a major impact on Steve Jobs and that was LSD. This is a quote from Steve Jobs. Taking LSD was a profound experience, one of the most important things in my life. That's a major, major thing for someone to say. And it reminded me of the Apple computer campaigns, ad campaigns that we're all so familiar with. Think different, indeed. At the same time, starting in the 80s, someone else whose roots go back to the counterculture and the psych psychedelic culture of the 60s, was also embracing computers as a tool to empower the individual. And that was Dr. Timothy Leary. At the time, Dr. Leary was going around and he had changed his message from the familiar turn on, tune in, drop out that he said in the 60s to turn on, tune in, boot up. And Dr. Leary released software this is Mind Mirror, a software package he released with Electronic Arts in the very early 1980s. And the software package was based on the psychology research that he had done at Harvard many years before. It was in the late 80s that I met Dr. Leary. At the time, he was going around raving about how virtual reality was the new LSD. And his argument was virtual reality enabled you to create a very immersive experience that was completely unlike the reality that we're all accustomed to. That was the most important thing to him as a tool for empowering the individual to shift their perception, to change reality. And at the same time, this is now moving into the early 90s, there were other technologies that had a very psychedelic bent to them. Fractal mathematics, for example, as a tool for understanding the order and chaos around us everywhere. And in many ways, of course, the fractals that were produced, these mathematical visualizations um, of, our, of our chaotic universe remind me very much of the tie-dye of the 1960s and the light shows of the time. In the San Francisco Bay Area, a lot of people were using these tools of the personal computer to generate their own media content. This was the time of the desktop publishing revolution where people could create their own zines. One of them was called High Frontiers, started by someone named Ken Goffman who goes by the name of Are You Serious? It was a very interesting zine. It was about a lot of disparate things, but somehow they all fit together. Space age, psychedelics, science, human potential, irreverent, counterculture. Look at the contributors. Albert Hoffman, Timothy Leary, Terence McKenna, another psychedelic guru, and Andrew Weil, who's been embraced um, by the mainstream for his um, alternative health uh, uh, ideas. High Frontier has moved even further toward the computer age when it transformed into reality hackers. It was all about ways to apply the mindset of computer hackers, people who were taking technology and reshaping it to suit their needs, but applying that mantra to everything in your world. Of course, reality hackers evolved into Mondo 2000, 
which was a magazine firmly about the cyberdelic culture, the link between psychedelics and computers. This is where you would read writers like Bruce Sterling and William Gibson and Rudy Rucker and William S. Burroughs all in the same pages together. It was a mindset and it didn't take itself too seriously. This is also what gave birth to Boing Boing. As Sylvie mentioned, Boing Boing was a print zine that my best friend Mark Fraunfelder and his wife launched in 1989, inspired by desktop publishing and inspired by Timothy Leary and the work he was doing. Boing Boing was a magazine about brain toys and cyberpunk and mind expansion and computers and ways that people could empower themselves through new media at the time to change their reality, to hack their reality. Now this was before the web, and this was before the widespread use of, of the internet by the mainstream. So where were these people hanging out? Where were we all meeting each other? Online, but through online bulletin board systems, like the Well, the Whole Earth Electronic Link, started by Stuart Brand and friends. This was a place that embodied this Timothy Leary idea that always stuck with me, where you know, a journalist once asked Tim, you know, after you turn on, Tim, and tune in, what do you do next? And he said, you find the others. And online was the place where people who had disparate beliefs and unusual interests and counterculture bents could find each other and connect and share information together long before the birth of the web. Now, in San Francisco and other places, people were also meeting in the real world. We talked earlier about dance and the importance of dance and connecting people together. This was the birth of the rave scene in San Francisco, Detroit, London, other places. Music, dance, media, and art, fueled by LSD, MDMA, <laughs> other psychedelics. They were multimedia immersive dance experiences. They resembled very much the acid tests of the 60s. So, what came out of that? Well, here are a few people that you might be interested in meeting. This is Brian Behlendorf. Brian organized SF Raves, an online listserv with all the underground raves in San Francisco. Brian was a programmer who went on to create Apache, which is the open source HTTP server that powers almost every website that you've ever been to. The open source mindset, of course, was inspired by the counterculture. Kevin Herbert, one of Cisco's earliest employees, who famously said that when I'm on LSD and hearing something that's pure rhythm, it le takes me to another world and into another brain state where I've stopped thinking and started knowing. Kevin famously talked about how he had some of his greatest technological breakthroughs while listening to Grateful Dead drum solos while on acid. Tying us back to the Grateful Dead, John Perry Barlow in the upper right, John was a cattle rancher and also a Grateful Dead lyricist. He went on with John Gilmore and Mitch Kapoor to found the Electronic Frontier Foundation that fights for our rights in cyberspace. And what if Stuart Brand founded with friends the Long Now Foundation to think about long-term futures? Stuart's latest project with others is the Great Passenger Pigeon Comeback to use the tools of genetic engineering to revive extinct species. It's where I met Joey Ito. At the time, living in Japan, he brought Timothy Leary over and helped bring the, the rave movement to Japan. Then, Timothy, or then Joey came back to the United States, became CEO of Creative Commons. Now he's the director of the MIT Media Lab. There he is with Tim. So what have we learned from this? We've learned that Computers are drugs, just like drugs are computers. And where are we going from here? Virtual reality, Oculus Rift, which I saw that you can demonstrate outside. A technology that enables you very inexpensively to immerse yourself in a world that will make you believe that you are there. And tools like Minecraft, where my seven-year-old can create very surreal otherworldly experiences that are incredibly immersive and live in them and build in them with people from all over the world. 
And eventually, cyberspace becomes an overlay on top of our existing reality through augmented reality. And these strange, otherworldly experiences become part of our physical reality. We're having a sensory transformation. New kinds of digital synesthesia are starting to emerge. For example, this. It translates video taken by the camera on the glasses into sensations that you feel on your tongue, rewiring your brain temporarily in ways that are very similar to the psychedelic experience. You see, the more we learn about the brain, the more we use digital technology, in fact, to understand our brain and the mind that's the software that runs on our brain, we can do all kinds of new things. Of course, the military is interested. Technology that enables them to scan our brains and detect when we feel stressed out and alter uh, our immersive computing experiences based on our levels of stress. And we can do interventions like transcranial magnetic therapy. This is when a magnet shoots pulses at your brain that you don't actually physically feel. It doesn't hurt you, but it can turn on and off parts of your brain at various times. The jury's still out, but there's interesting studies showing that these magnetic pulses can enhance creativity. And this one, from Ecoli Polytechnic, is an out-of-body experience enabled through virtual reality, where a person sees their body from the outside in. Where does that take us? It takes us to one simple thing to remember that you have to go out of your mind to use your head. Thank you very much. And for, for those who are interested in, in learning more about these topics, um, here are three fantastic books that I recommend very much. Cyber, Siberia, From Counterculture to Cyberculture, and John Markoff, who was a professor of mine, What the Dormouse Said, all of these stories um, at least of the 60s and leading up to the Mondo age are covered in great depth there. So, thank you. Thank you, David. Um, first, we won't have LSD tonight at the party. I'm sorry, many questions on Twitter. That's okay, as Salvador <laughs> Dali said, I don't do drugs, I am drugs. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good one. So, David, do you think there's some kind of um, psychedelic revolution that could happen again soon? Um, I think what you're going to see is, um, as we understand more about how the brain works, um, I think that the um, neurodrugs that have been available until now are very blunt instruments, mm -hmm. very blunt tools, um, you know, essentially the Stone Age. And I think as we understand more about how the brain works, we'll be able to develop new compounds um, and new technologies uh, uh, to help us achieve desired outcomes with much more specificity and much more safely. Okay. And is there another way on earth you can imagine to live except for Silicon Valley, San Francisco, where you have like the same vibes or history or? <laughs> well, I mean, I think that, that, that um, you know, it was a very interesting time, a very interesting moment, a very rare moment in San Francisco. And I think that that culture is still very much alive there. Mm -hmm. But I think there's very interesting cultures happening all over the world, as we've seen here um, at this conference. You know, I'm, I'm dying to go to Berlin. Yeah, we all will visit Juval and his friends, <laughs> right? <laughs> all right. Um, I think it's time to wrap up the conference. And I'll let you do that. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you, David. <laughs> <laughs>